All right, thank you very much. I, I wanted to say something about the, the climate of Madison. Um, I grew up about two hours uh, north of Madison, and I assure you that where I grew up is a much better thermodynamic simulator than North Pole than is Madison. <laughs> and uh, in fact, when I was a, a candidate, a, a graduate student, uh, I was very interested in coming to Madison to do my graduate studies. I applied to the genetics program here, and I got a very nice uh, letter back from them saying that we're sorry you're not accepted. Uh, unfortunately, we've only taken four students this year, and you're not one of them. And so over the years, I've convinced myself that I was probably number five on the list, but I'm not sure. <laughs> But it was uh, that decision that caused me to, to go to Purdue University uh, as a graduate student, where I worked with uh, uh, Pete Gillum, uh, who was a postdoc for a number of years with uh, Golden Quran. And so while a, a grad student with uh, uh, Pete Gillum, um, I learned quite a bit about um, chemical and enzymatic synthesis of nucleic acids and applying those molecules to study what I thought were important biological questions. And at the time, we began to work with analogs of nucleic acids that could be used uh, to study the mechanisms of ribozymes. And it's that theme of applying uh, chemical and enzymatically synthesized uh, nucleic acids to study uh, fundamental questions in, in nucleic acid biology which has driven my lab at Yale ever since. Uh, so, and I won't tell you much about um, some of the early work we did at Yale, other than to say that we, we applied both chemical and enzymatically synthesized nucleic acids to, uh, to test the, uh, the functional capabilities of, of RNA and DNA. So we, we did a, quite a bit of molecular engineering to create DNAs that would do chemistry, for example, or RNAs that would fold up and work as ribosomes or as aptomers. And in one uh, series of experiments, we uh, uh, evolved in the test tube a series of molecules, uh, uh, RNA molecules, that would act as molecular sensors and molecular switches. They could bind some small target molecule and change the activity of an adjoining uh, catalytic RNA domain. And it was that work that caused us to go back into biology and ask whether there are more functional RNAs in, in biology that, uh, that may be rare or that have been overlooked over the years. And once we find them, we want to understand a bit about how they work. So I just uh, put this slide together just to remind you that there are some classic examples of large structured non-coding RNAs. Everyone knows uh, uh, translation is largely driven um, uh, by uh, RNA components of the ribosome. tRNAs, of course, are involved in this process. Uh, uh, protein localization, in part, uh, is due to uh, the signal recognition particle RNA. There's a series of catalytic RNAs that are involved in RNA processing. RNAs P is nearly ubiquitous amongst uh, cells from all three domains of life. Um, and then even uh, gene regulation, a wonderful example of 6-sRNA, which uh, is studied here on campus by Karen Wasserman, uh, is a, it's a wonderful and very widespread aptomer for RNA polymerase in bacteria. Um, and this aptomer controls uh, gene expression in a, in a global fashion. But what about other examples of non-coding RNAs that may still be out there in bacteria? So how are we going to find these structured RNAs? Well, we're going to, we're going to use um, uh, the genomics revolution to spy uh, interesting uh, sequences that may indeed function as non-coding, structured non-coding RNAs. I mean, there's a variety of ways that you can go about doing this. One, for example, you can just simply crack open cells, clone and sequence the small RNAs that are present and determine whether any of those have some uh, interesting structures and biological functions. Uh, we've wisely done the last two approaches. One of them we, we sort of casually call gap gazing. That is, if you take a bacterial genome, which tends to be quite condensed in terms of uh, the, the, the positioning of genes, coding regions in the genome, and you look for non-coding intergenic regions, or IGRs, and then you ask whether there's anything of interest, any non-coding RNA of interest that may be there. And you can, you can look for that RNA by probing for it, see if it's expressed. Uh, another simple trick that, that, that we use is you, is you look for bacterial species that have very few intergenic regions. They don't have very many large ones. So when they do have a large one, it tends to be of importance. There's something there. And if you stack that on top of the analysis of bacterial genomes that are very rich in A and T uh, and very poor in G and C, well, if you have an intergenic region, that's very high in, in GC content, that implies that there may be a structural RNA there uh, uh, because the structured RNAs are going to tend to have a, a, a more equal mix of, of uh, GCs and As and Us. 
the other approach, which, which I think is, is for us is most uh, successful, and that's to use computers to try to identify highly conserved sequences and structures uh, in these intergenic regions. All right, so one of the most common structured RNAs that we identify while, while carrying this process out are RNAs that we've called riboswitches. These are natural structured RNAs uh, uh, that are usually present in messenger RNAs, and they bind small molecule metabolites, and they control the gene expression. Right, and typical configuration is an open reading frame, uh, messenger RNA is the open reading frame. They're usually going to be in the five prime untranslated regions of these RNAs. Uh, and they're going to have two functional, uh, if not separate, structural domains. Uh, one we call an aptamine, it's aptamine, some small uh, uh, compound. And that's going to be the most highly conserved portion because you've got four different types of nucleotides trying to fold into a receptor that selectively binds some target metabolite that, never, that itself never changes in evolution. So the aptamine is going to be highly conserved, and therefore we can spot it by bioinformatics analysis. And then the expression platform is just some down, usually it's a downstream RNA structure that changes its shape when the ligand binds the aptamine. And that shape change in the expression platform changes gene expression. That's much less well conserved, and so we tend not to look for uh, uh, these kinds of elements until after we've found uh, the aptamers. Now, over the years, we've found probably about 20, between 20 and 25 validated classes now, depending on how you count them. Uh, here shows 10 classes in one organism, Bacillus subtilis, soil bacterium, it has a circular genome. The colored flags around the circle indicate the various genes that are uh, um, uh, controlled by the switches that are arrayed around the outside in cartoon form. So for example, this, uh, uh, this RNA structure here binds this metabolite glucosamine 6-phosphate. Uh, this is actually a very strange riboswitch in that when the ligand binds, the messenger RNA self-destructs. So it's a ribozyme riboswitch that uses this compound as a cofactor to cut itself. And it controls one gene, the GlynS gene. That gene goes for the protein, which forms an enzyme that makes more glucosamine 6-phosphate. Okay, so simple feedback regulation. But here the RNA switch is all that's required to control that process. Now, there's, I'm not going to talk about all these switches, but I do want to mention a little bit about thiamine pyrophosphate switches. I believe there are five transcriptional units controlling about a dozen genes. All of those genes are involved in thiamine metabolism, transport or production of thiamine, or thiamine pyrophosphate. And I'll say a few words about adenosylcobalamin. Uh, and its uh, collection of riboswitches as well. So uh, one of the things that we, we, we argued very early on is that if riboswitches are these receptors for these metabolites that are controlling genes that are essential for the cell to survive, then if we could chemically trick those riboswitches into firing, shut off gene expression, for example, even though they're, they're starved for the compound interest, then we may be able to kill the bacterial cell. And so we, we made these arguments, at least theoretically, in the beginning. And now we have examples of four different riboswitch classes where that's the case. Compounds, some of them made in the 1950s, uh, known to kill bacteria for decades. Uh, we now know that some of those compounds target uh, riboswitches. And I just wanted to, to show you this one here. This is an a, a X-ray structure model for, for TPP riboswitches. Uh, and it grips uh, the ligand here in the center. It grips the pyrophosphate moiety of TPP on this side. It grips the HMP moiety on the other side. And in between, the thiazole moiety is not recognized by the RNA. So it's not surprising then that this compound, pyrothiamine, first synthesized again in the 19, uh, late 40s or early 50s, uh, uh, is, is, it fools the virus, which tricks the virus which into firing when there's not enough thiamine pyrophosphate around. And this, uh, 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 compound, you can use it to select for resistant strains of both bacteria and fungi, and both bacteria and fungi have mutations in the riboswitch that render the organism resistant to, uh, to the compound. Now, I also said I'd bring up a little bit uh, about uh, SAM riboswitches. I, I put this collection on the board because I felt as though it best represented the diversity of riboswitches that we could find, even for the same compound. So the compound or compounds of interest here are SAM, the coenzyme SAM. This is the cell's methylating agent. Uh, this methyl group is transferred off to um, various other small molecule or polymer targets uh, by SAM utilizing enzymes. Once that methyl group is, is donated, you get s adenosylcholecysteine or SAH. That's toxic to cells, and cells need to detoxify this. So they have to turn genes on to destroy that compound. Well, we know how that's done. In many, many cells, they'll have SAH 
RIDO switches, this RNA uh, structure, uh, where red is 97% conserved, uh, and, and the structural features as shown are highly conserved as well. This SA driver switch will recognize this compound at least tenfold more tightly than it recognizes SAM. And I say at least tenfold because if you buy commercial SAM, uh, there will be about 10% it spontaneously breaks down in the SAH. It'll be about 10% contamination of the SAH. So we know it's at least a tenfold discrimination uh, 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 that the SAH switch generates against SAM. But all the other structures up here selectively recognize SAM and reject SAH by 100 to 1,000 fold or even more. Now what's notable about these is that there are at least three distinct classes of these RNAs. SAM1, this is the S-box RNA that was originally identified by Tina and Hankin and shown by several labs, including her own, uh, that is a SAM sensing uh, rival switch. SAM2 has a completely different architecture and different conserved bases that recognize the light. So it's a little bit hard to see here, but the green shaded areas in these RNAs end up being the ligand binding pocket. And the bold nucleotides in those green shaded areas are nucleotides that directly contact the ligand interest. So these two are really different architectures that recognize SAM in, in different ways. Uh, Tina Higgins' lab also found uh, SAM3. And then our lab has found <coughs> RNAs that we call SAM4, SAM5, and SAM6. But if you take a closer look at those, although the appendages are distinct, the ligand binding cores of those RNAs group into either SAM1 or SAM2 classes. So even though we have, uh, what, six or seven structures there, we really only have four major aptamer classes here. But nonetheless, this is the most uh, diverse collection of ribs, which is for any single uh, group of, of metabolites. So one of the reasons why we wanted to look at this classification issue is that I want to make this plot here. And what this plot is, the name of the ribe switch class versus how many examples of that virus switch class we have in, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about 500 sequence genomes when we made this graphic. Uh, now, just be careful here a bit, the, 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 the black bars are virus switches that have been validated, usually by biochemical evidence that they bind the metabolite of interest, and genetic evidence to suggest that they indeed control gene expression when that logging binds. The open bars are virus switch candidates. We think they're virus switches, but we haven't found um, uh, the usually, it's, we haven't found a metabolite that binds the, the, the RNA. <coughs> All right, so nonetheless, uh, we have more copies of TPP ribos, which is than anything else. We have nearly 3,000 in these five hundred genomes. The dentist of cobalamine ribos, which is second, or coenzyme B12. Uh, here's our SAM1, SAM4 uh, co uh, collection, an unknown, uh, FMN lysine, etc. Now, what's odd about this plot, you know, other than the fact that um, there's some very, very common virus switches. Almost, if you're a bacterium, and, uh, you're likely to have this TPP virus switch. But there are virus switches that are much more rare. And what's really odd about this is that the numbers of virus switches don't sort randomly. So if you randomly pick 20 numbers between 3,000 and 0, and made a plot like this, you get a straight line. And some scatter, of course, but a straight line. These don't sort randomly. In other words, there's an ever-increasing number of rival switch classes that have an ever-decreasing number of copies, or ever more rare. This looks like it should fit a power law. And if it does, and it's a little bit too early to say because we don't have that much data, if it does, we suspect that there should be hundreds of classes of rival switches that have yet to be discovered. And of course, we want to find some of those, at least maybe some of the more interesting ones. And so we have our computer algorithms out there searching for conserved sequences and structures. Those algorithms tend to spit out data that looks like this. And then we have to come in and manually assess, are, these, are any of these structures riboswitches? Or are they some other functional RNAs that we might be interested in studying? I won't, of course, go through all these in any detail, but I'll point out a few problems we have. For example, this is a weird-looking version of what we now know is the SAH riboswitch. The computer got the structure wrong. And we were able, of course, to fix that problem and then identify it as an SAH rival switch. Uh, this, pure D, is a very distant cousin of 6S uh, RNA, the aptamer that I said binds uh, RNA polymerase. So this is not a, a, a novel RNA. It's just a very distal uh, cousin of one that's already known. Uh, we don't like these RNAs very much because they are probably protein-binding elements. For example, you look at this uh, RNA we call mini YKKC. Uh, this thing has two fairly similar looking hairpins. Looks like a great place for two 
uh, protein subunits to come from a dimer and then dot on that RNA. Probably control the gene expression or some uh, phenomenon. But this here is, we can think, uh, one of the more exciting ribosome classes that we've identified to date. This is a ribosome that senses the bacterial second messenger cyclic IgMP, which I believe we heard about yesterday. Uh, this, uh, of course, this RNA is, is uh, two, two GMPs linked together, 3 prime, 5 prime phosphodiester bonds to make this infinitely long RNA dimer. It's a, a second messenger for uh, uh, signaling various physiological changes in many, many bacteria. And we now know that there's a ribosome class out there that senses this compound and controls the expression of numerous genes in the organisms that house this ribosome. So just recall that uh, the cell takes two GTPs using a diguanolate cyclase to make cyclic dig, and then that cyclic mo uh, molecule is broken down into the linear form, or PG, PG, by phosphodiesterases. So we have various uh, uh, tools uh, in the lab to determine does the RNA bind the line of interest and does it control gene expression. I'm not going to go into this in any detail, just note that we can radioactively label these RNAs. Um, uh, this one is from Vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera has two of these RNAs, and this is the second one in its genome. We can then label the RNA, we can run it on a gel, and we can ask whether or not the RNA binds the compound of interest by looking at probing assays that determine whether there are shape changes in the RNA. And again, I'll spare you the details, but just note that when we add cyclic IgMP, we see some of these bands disappearing, and that's an indication that there are shape changes going on that make the RNA more stable in those positions. So we can use this kind of approach to, um, uh, to determine binding affinities. We know that this RNA indeed uh, binds the light of interest with about a kidney of about one nanomolar, and it discriminates by uh, at least a thousand-fold against almost every other analog we've thrown at it that we think might be biologically relevant likely linear form of the, of, the, of the compound. And then here, in this assay here, we're simply taking this RNA element, grafting or grafting the, 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 the five prime or translated region of a gene that houses this element um, in front of a reporter gene, beta galactosidase, and then we're uh, uh, transfecting those cells either with just empty vector or a vector that carries a phosphodiesterase that targets the second messenger. And we overexpress this phosphodiesterase, it destroys the second messenger, lowers the concentration of compound interest. We get a, 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 a boost in gene expression, which indicates that this is a genetic off switch. Uh, cyclic IG binding this RNA shuts expression off. If we destroy the compound, we get a boost in expression. This is a, simply a mutation of that nuclease that has a, a, a single point mutation that knocks out the active site. And of course, we don't see a lowering of cyclic IG concentrations or, or a, a change in gene expression. So, uh, as I said, Vibrio cholera has two of these RNAs. In each case, I'll indicate the RNA that's present with this little hairpin, and then the genes that are associated with it. Transcription factor of unknown function. This is the protein that Vibrio cholera expresses when it wants to grab onto mammalian cells in order to infect them. Clostridium difficile, another nasty human pathogen, has 12 of these RNAs. Uh, one of them controls the entire flagellar op uh, operon. So all the, all the hardware needed to make flagella uh, apparatus for the cell to swim uh, is controlled by a cyclic IgMP binding virus switch. And what's really strange about this, other than the fact that many of the genes that are being controlled are unknown, those open boxes, unknown genes, but two of these 12 are associated with bacteriophage. So somehow there are bacteriophages out there that have decided to use this virus switch probably to peer in on the physiology, the physiological status of the bacterial cell. Uh, uh, Geobacter uranium reducens has 30 of these RNAs on 25 different transcriptional units. And what's notable here is that five of those examples are tandem ribo switches. They have two cyclic IG ribo switches back to back in the same messenger RNA. We've seen things like that before, and there's two major reasons why cells tend to use them. One is that these uh, RNAs can work cooperatively to give you a sharper dose response curve, so they have a more sensitive response to smaller changes in lighting. And the other reason is that they can have dual gene control. One will control transcription, and one will control translation, so you can control uh, expression at both levels. And uh, again, I won't talk about the x-ray structure of this, but Scott Strobel's lab has solved the x-ray structure of one of these examples. Um, there's a, quite a few conventional interactions that allow the lighting to be selectively docked into the RNA here. 
And I won't go into the lack of recognition details other than to say that it looks like there's plenty of room to manipulate the light to fool cells into thinking they have plenty of this compound when in fact they have very little. All right, I wanted to uh, uh, spend just a couple of minutes telling you about some of the most bizarre RNAs that we've identified. Again, our computer algorithms spit out these consensus sequences. We then go in and manually look at them to identify uh, various features that might be of interest. Uh, this here corresponds to these last two stems of an RNA we call Ocean 1. We don't know what else to call it because this thing is not in a sequenced bacterial organism. This is coming out of metagenomics data. Uh, so there's no known uh, uh, whole genome that's been sequenced that carries this RNA. Here's Ocean 2, and we have several more of these. These RNAs are bizarre, not so much because they have sophisticated RNA structures, which they do to a certain degree, um, but they are incredibly common in the organisms that do have them. So if you sample seawater, and look at what RNAs are being expressed. These are expressed at about the same concentration as ribosomal RNAs, but unknown functions. Uh, now, I'm plotting here the average size of the RNA that we're identifying here versus a relative measure of the complexity. How many stems and pseudonauts do they have? So ocean one is down here, small RNA with very little sophisticated structure. Here's ocean two. And on that, I've plotted some of the largest, or actually all, of the <coughs> largest bacterial non-coding RNAs that are known. On the opposite side here, ribosomal RNAs. Black here indicates that they're catalytic RNAs. Um, uh, uh, open is not ribosome, so you see there's some riboswitches here, B12 riboswitch, lysine, here's the GMS ribosome. But there are other RNAs out there that we're identifying. For example, we have one RNA we call HERO, the other one we call GOLD. I'm going to show you just two images of those. Uh, and then sum things up. So hero RNA, fairly complex, not as complex as some of the, the most complex RNAs, not about the same as group one self-splicing ribosomes. The structure made here is so sort of interesting, but the fact that there's usually an open reading frame embedded in this RNA is interesting to us, because that's reminiscent of, of group one and group two ribosomes that are associated with mobile genetic elements. So this open reading frame is usually an HNH and a nuclease, which is which in many cases involved in, in mobile genetic elements. And uh, the distribution, the genomic di distribution of hero RNA looks like it's a mobile genetic element. I'll just show you an example here. We have uh, a, a sequence that carries uh, hero RNA from Anavina, comparing that to Nostoc. They both have similar genomic locations. Here shows one point mutation in these organisms in its genomic location. One carries the RNA and one doesn't. And that RNA is slotted right in here. So the first few nucleotides of the RNA element, they're shown in green. The last four nucleotides are shown in blue. That sequence is here, and the same sequence here. That looks like a homing sequence, because every time we see this kind of arrangement, the RNA lands right in an ATGA sequence. So it looks like it's a transposal element. What's the RNA doing? I want to say it's a self-splicing RNA. Doesn't look like the other two self splicing RNAs that are known, but we don't know that yet. And then here's uh, my favorite large RNA that we've identified called Gold. Uh, it's called Gold because it's a, uh, a giant RNA, it's ornate. And oddly enough, it was originally found as in metagenomic data, only metagenomic data, from a lake, a uh, vector isolated from a lake in the Panama Canal. Uh, we now have found it in sauerkraut and yogurt uh, bacilli. Uh, so, what does this RNA do? We think this has something to do with phage biology. So we find this gene almost always located in prophage uh, uh, gene area. And this graphic shows that we're growing Lactobacillus brevis, which carries one of these examples, without any treatment, or in the right-hand side here, with mitomycin C. Mitomycin C induces phage production. So this graphic, the open bars indicate how much bacteria we're producing in, in uh, uh, density, and then black, is how much RNA is being expressed. So under normal conditions, lots of bacteria being, being made, very little RNA expressed. But if you induce phage, phage production, the cells begin to uh, replicate and then crash out as they lice, phage comes out and you get this huge spike of RNA being produced. And we've, we've done experiments to isolate DNA only from the phages, not the bacterial contaminant. And the genomic region of that RNA is coded by, is packaged by the phage. So there's something about this big RNA um, that's, that's you know, approaching the size of ribosomal RNA that has something to do with phage biology. 
Um, so to, to conclude, we think there are going to be a, a lot of novel structured RNAs to be identified, ribosuches, and other functional RNAs uh, uh, whose uh, activities remain to be determined. And I'll just note here that I think some of these are going to be very challenging to, uh, to, to figure out what they do, unless you have a phenotype or some connection, perhaps, to some biological phenomena. It would be hard to sit through these. I will uh, just put up this acknowledgement slide and, 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 and largely um, acknowledge uh, uh, collaborators who work with us, Larry Russo um, um, and co-workers with uh, uh, our bioinformatics work, and Scott Strobel uh, on the cyclic.g virus switch um, uh, and, and structure solving. All right, thank you.